Hello and welcome back to Dial H for Hero Clicks. Guys, we have a very special podcast for you today. But first off, joining me really quickly in the studio is, like always, Simeon Bruce. What's going on, Simeon? Not too much. Just a lovely too Friday much. out there. Yeah. It really is. It really is a beautiful day. And even more beautiful than that is, of course, the guests that we have on. Ladies and gentlemen, the folks from WizKids are super nice to let us go ahead and do a, a couple of podcasts. We're going to scratch their brains, ask them some questions. The theme for this week is set design. First up, we have Jake Tice. How's it going, Jake? Good. I, I like being described as beautiful. So, yeah, <laughs> Jake, Jake Tice, VP of Games at WizKids. And yeah, we're, we're really excited to, to take part in these and fun to, uh, to talk about the stuff that we're cooking on and how we do it. Fantastic. Next up, James O'Brien. James, want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Say hello to everybody at home. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm the Senior Product Manager on HeroClix. And last, but certainly not least, we have John Schreiner. How's it going, John? It is going great. Thanks so much for having us here. Uh, I'm John Schreiner, and I'm the Project Manager for all things HeroClix. Perfect. Jumping right into a couple of questions here. We're going over set design. There's obviously a lot that goes into a hero click set. So first off, pretty simple question. I want to get your guys' thoughts on it. But how do you choose a set theme? How do you decide that Wheels of Vengeance is going to be the Ghost Rider set? How do you decide not to make five Spider-Man sets a year? What, what goes into the thought process behind being like, yeah, we want this Marvel set, this Marvel set, this DC set, etc. And I'll let you guys run with it. Let's... Well, uh... That's literally something that we talk about every day. So when, when, when we decide uh, set themes, you know, the in, internally we call that a tent pole. So those are the big tent poles through the year. We're thinking about our set themes, the big booster releases, and, and that's what what guides Hero Clicks or, or any collectible game. Um, on the Hero Clicks set theme front, you know, the, there are uh, myriad factors of how we do it. But I'd say the the first one is you know in a licensed game. We work with the licensor and have a guarantee for we're going to make uh, a certain amount of products per year or a certain amount of stuff per year or a certain amount of dollars of stuff per year. So the first thing that uh, we, we need to think about is, are, you know, are we living up to our end of the bargain for working with a licensor or a different partner and then ma matching that up to the, the products that we're making for the year? And then once you kind of have established the number of products that we're doing, then we hone in and, and start to look at uh, each of the kind of macro themes for it. And we know there are different you know, characters that are the characters that people expect for each of these different uh, licenses. So uh, w when we look, you know, the, the nice thing about Hero Clicks is we have 20 years of, of history. We can look back and see what did people respond the most to, what did people uh, not respond to, and see where those opportunities lie. And then further break that out and say uh, on the flip side of that coin uh, are people fatigued on certain characters or certain themes or are there ways that we can essentially compartmentalize it where we can get uh, uh, where the license is going to be when the licensor is there so for instance you know uh, th this summer th there's a very enormous Deadpool and Wolverine movie that's going to come out and we wanted to make sure that we had booster product there for when the person says, I just saw that movie, I had the, a, a great time, or I've just dug back into the editorial. I love Deadpool and I want to dig into all the different stories about Deadpool and the wild characters from that universe, or you know the, the history of Wolverine, that we have something for that player and that they don't say, oh man, I, I really wish they would have made something for me, the, the you know classic X fan there in that spot. And then... Uh, in terms of your, your your prior question on Wheels of Vengeance and Ghost Rider, um, I think that one we, we kind of arrived at working backwards in that uh, we had done a few Avenger sets and a big Spider-Man set, and it basically sang our song over the, the course of, of, of three sets for big tentpole known beloved characters. And the thought was could we hone in on a specific character in a universe and make the ultimate set for the fan of that character where the goal would be, you know, if I'm a fan of character X, in this case, Ghost Rider, I play this and I was like, oh, I can't believe they made Vengeance. I can't believe they made Orb and kind of run through those, those kind of definable uh, rogues for that character that they're excited about. But then also, too, you know, what are those themes that you would expect in a Ghost Rider book? You know, I think the, those uh, monster themes and the kind of darkness and fire were, were things that we wanted to convey across there. 
And then th there's a marriage there too of when we look at what people responded to and what people purchased before, you know, but what were they excited about? Uh, on another license that we work with, uh, vehicle-based content was very popular. And that was something where the idea of like, oh, like if we're gonna make a really honed in specific thing on a character, which Marvel character has a vehicle that is the most exciting to build a set around? And like the answer at that point was like, oh, it's Ghost Rider. Like the, if you're gonna do the vehicle set for Marvel, like how about the guy who's synonymous with being on a motorcycle? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was kind of that first step. And then as we were thinking about product innovation and set by set, you know, a recurring theme is what have we not done in hero clicks before each time that we get the drawing board out and start to think about okay we're starting with a blank slate uh where do we want to start what have we not done i i was passionate about the idea of glow in the dark and hero glow is something that we uh, and john deserves a lot of credit for working really hard uh with, with factories and with folks to try to get the the technology on it right and get the the production side of it right but the thought was, you know, could we make fire? Could, could we make it uh, feel uh, completely unique to that set? And, you know, I think in terms of uh, gameplay and, and all of those factors after that, you know, I think holistically we want to make sure that gameplay is part of the discussion for the set that we're building. But I think in isolation, you know, we, we, as we choose those macro themes, the gameplay follows and we want to make sure that it matches the, the themes that we select. So oh. this concludes my TED talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I could add, I just want to say sometimes um, we just get really excited about a specific idea and like want to execute that the best way we can. So like Jake was saying with vehicles for MV51, the thought is that every time that you open up a pack of that set, like you are experiencing something exciting about the vehicle gameplay or the way that we brought the pilot trait kind of into the game and um, without maybe bringing back exactly the way vehicles used to be and like a modernization right. of that. And I think that um, sometimes something like that is just so exciting for us that it's like easy to build around that concept. Um, and then, like Jake said, you just match like which character makes the most sense with this thing we're excited to do. Ghost Rider was, uh, was an easy winner for that. And then I think, you know, if we were to to talk about the sets before and after that as well, and maybe even lo loosely some upcoming things um, and, and kind of filling in those set themes over the course of the year. Uh, on the Notorious front, the way that we ended up with DC Notorious was essentially earlier in the year, we, we had Batman team up and Batman team up was a very heroic set. And, you know, it had a lot of different themes that uh, the, the team was able to incorporate. And essentially, it's a, a great buffet of themes uh, on Batman team up, you know, whether you're a Lanterns fan or Scooby-Doo or Batman, like it had a lot of heroic, fun uh, design going on with it and, and character selection. And I think when we think about set designs, uh, making sure that each next set has some narrative glue or set design glue to the sets prior to it's important. But then it also needs to be the converse, where it doesn't feel like, okay, I'm just buying uh, the, the second incarnation of what I've already taken part in, and making sure that they can feel fresh from each other. On uh, Notorious, the, the way that we arrived there was essentially uh, asking different fans and Heroclix fans, particularly like at, at different events, like what are those core themes that people are most excited about that we haven't done in DC yet? And we jotted down our list of like, here's seven to 10 things that fans keep asking for. And Deceased was up there, Black Lanterns were up there, and Justice was up there. And as we started to build that list out and take a look at it, the theme across a chunk of those, you know, four or five of those was villains. And essentially it was like, if you just draw a circle around, like the, these are the, the things that are highly demanded from the fan, you know, it was, can we deliver a set that has all of those together? And then what is that overarching package that, that you can put into it? Okay. So making a set and kind of figuring out what the theme is going to be, a lot of that can just be, what are the fans looking for? What have they been asking for in the game? And then what are some core mechanics that you want to translate over to Hero Clicks and then a good character to kind of build around that? That's cool. That's a, a good bridge, too, for for Jimmy, who hasn't spoken yet, too, in that Jimmy's our conduit into licensing and is talking with Marvel and, and Warner Brothers on the DC Comics licenses weekly. And, you know, we're, Jimmy's in the most active conversation with them. 
And for a set like Next Phase, you know, which is uh, Im- imminently releasing, uh, talking with Marvel, that there's also or DC that there's also getting a sense of like what are they excited about? What are they pushing marketing behind? You know, what are they eager to support? And then also, um, you know, content has uh, an ephemeral quality to it too, where the right content at the right time is meaningful. So on our standpoint uh, for Deadpool and Wolverine, you know, we want to make sure that it's the right content at the right time, that we have Deadpool Weapon X to be able to, to deliver against that. Jimmy, uh, you know, yeah. has worked with Marvel uh, on Next Phase, and I think can kind of speak to how we selected the assortments I mean, there. So what, one of the things was, you know, we're, we get started with these projects before we get to see the shows. Uh, but by the time it hits the market, everybody's seen the shows. So it's, it's really challenging for the team to try to deliver on the expectations when we're sometimes just dealing with, um, you know, a description and a best guess. Mm. And what one of the memorable conversations with Next Phase going into it was talking to our licensing contact and just trying to get a vibe. What what is She-Hulk going to feel like? Mm. Uh, it the, I, I found the show to be a ton of fun. But when you look at kind of the long arc of what She-Hulk comics have been, you know, sometimes She-Hulk is that fourth wall breaking, you know, character reminiscent of Deadpool. Sometimes she's kind of the romance comic with superpowers. Sometimes she's this horror comic of I've got this like Hulk strength. Uh, how do I live a normal life? And so it's like, hey, what's you know, what's this show going to be like? Oh, it's, you know, Ally McBeal, the superpowers. She's more Deadpool than Deadpool, like that kind of feedback is so awesome for us to steer and say, well, what what are the sculpts going to be like? What are the what should the gameplay feel like? What should the special powers and traits evoke as far as the emotional reaction from the fan? And so we do have a little. I think there's a little bit of time usually where the show is in market and we can kind of make those last minute changes. Um, but making those last minute changes when it's not something we're really close to from the get go can be pretty challenging. Um, but yeah, yeah t- fine. Oh, to, to, to that point, and I think it's a, a salient point, Jimmy. I think the the production process to do pre-painted plastic miniatures is, is about a year. So, like, mm-hmm. if we all on this call agree we want to do something in a year, like, it might be re- ready for mm-hmm. the shelf. And that's if everything goes correctly. Um, yeah. So, a- educated guesses are uh, a pretty key part of, of choosing set themes and something that... You know, we attempt to get it as right as possible, and you know, yeah, things change. And w- without talking out of turn on, on the licensing front, and I'll wait to see if, if Jimmy cringes here, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think there are some things that fans have asked for in Next Phase that, one, just uh, we're eager to do and uh, eager to follow up on. And I think there's things from Disney Plus that we didn't know would emerge that we were able to pay off in next phase, like um, like a Dancing Zemo, for instance, or you know so, some um, minor additions there, different additions that we thought would be fun. Uh, I think there's future opportunity for Marvel Studios, but, but I think just kind of getting a sense of what their, uh, what their plans are and how our timelines operate, I'd assume if we dabble more with Marvel Studios content, it'll be less in a, a booster capacity and more in non-booster products. You know, whether it's Marvel Studios Iconics or promo goods or, or other things. There, I think there there's some fun ways that we can do it in a way that uh, is not going to be on a, a, a booster set timeline. Yeah, and I think. Um... The fans have kind of caught us on occasion when a licensor, in their best efforts to share with us early, shares with us something that ends up changing. But then we don't Mm -hmm. always find out about the change or we find out too late. And so, oh, I can't believe this wasn't exactly what I expected from seeing the movie. Like, Mm -hmm. we we wish we could have delivered on the expectation better ourselves. Um, And sometimes they think that's why it's better when there is a little bit of a delay that uh, we're not day and date with a theatrical or TV release, but we're a little bit after, and it's a a better fit for everybody involved. Um, to to kind of that point too, with um, kind of delivering on those those different expectations and how we're able to kind of do the follow ups. 
I think that we're kind of lucky that we're not exposed to that ultra secret information that the licensor wants to be a surprise because as buttoned up as we, we might be, you know, if, if product were, let's say shipping and someone from customs leaks the photo, like I'm happy that it's not the WizKids product that, that spoils the show for people, right? That can, that can be some other licensee. Yeah. Well, I think too, to kind of put, put the final uh, book end on the, the set design concepting and kind of mm-hmm. thinking about it forward. Yeah, we, we all, uh, the majority of us all just came back from uh, Gamma, but which is a, from a company standpoint, a trade show for the game industry. And the interesting thing about Gamma is you get to talk to retailers from all around the world. So this time I think there were 800 retailers that uh, have game shops from all over. And they're not shy about telling you what they like, what they don't like, what they want to see. And interesting talking and getting feedback from them. It was part of the presentations there. Um, we, we revealed the Marvel Hero Clicks Black Panther set that'll be coming out later this year. And that uh, one, I think, uh, we wanted to make sure we had kind of the Ghost Rider feel, uh, meaning in a Wheels of Vengeance sense of isolating on a character. And making sure that if you are a Black Panther fan, like you got your Black Panther set and that we really did uh, a a service there paying off the characters that people want and some of the underrepresented characters in the, the, you know, Wakanda uh, uh, universe and the specifically on that, the the Pantheon. one piece of feedback that we get early on is from playtesting. You know, we, we work with a lot of different playtesters on the game, but before the product is released, the feedback that we got on the uh, deity mechanics and God, Egyptian gods mechanics uh, in Eid from Next Phase was particularly strong. And that was something that as we were talking to them, we thought like, oh, maybe there there's something fun there too, where like we could expand out that that is a sub theme and put that with Black Panther. Um, you know, Bast has never been clicked before, so that was something where there's that bridge there easily to start building out that. And then, you know, the nice part about comics and, and editorial is then you also get 70 years of comics to pull from, to pull forward, like uh, relevant Black Panther storylines, God-specific storylines, uh, deity mechanics, and then make them feel uh, both part of the clicks universe mechanically, but then also to make it feel unique to the booster set as well. And I, I think to, to that point of there's 70 years of stuff to pull from, um, it's an embarrassment of riches that we have to go through and make some tough choices about, you know, who are the best 25 or 50 or 75 of whatever theme and how do we fit in the sub themes and what's the, what's the best overlap, whether it's fun or it's, um, you know, scratching an itch that players haven't had a chance to collect yet. Um, and I think as we kind of see the situations unfold and we, we learn more, maybe we'd make a different decision next time, especially when there's kind of the, the different surprises through editorial and fan we reactions. Have, um, we, we have other levers that we can work with there too, that we use yeah. like the, when it comes to, legacy cards if, if a figure can't make it in the set has been clicks before and we think there's an interesting opportunity there for legacy card content that, that's a nice bridge for us uh, particularly like with, with wheels of vengeance figuring out what are uh, ghost rider characters that we would love to get in that couldn't make the cut and then making sure that we have legacy card content for them was something that uh is a thing that we plan around and then to a certain extent too um with primes we have a storytelling capacity there as well where where essentially we can tell different versions of of a story with a character with the prime slot or different aspects of of the story um and then potentially too like with notorious uh king shark and, and camo come to mind where you know uh in a world where we, we knew we wanted to get King Shark in to have some of the Suicide Squad overlaps that, that exist in that set and to be able to build uh, to, to a fan's expectation of kind of the modern-ish Suicide Squad. Uh, that, that was something that we were interested by. And then, you know, once you've sculpted a, a giant uh, humanoid shark, you're like, you're not going to not do camo, right? Like, so... <laughs> yeah. So we kind of talked about 
some of the extra things I wanted to kind of get into as far as like a set goes, like deciding legacy cards, deciding a set list. You kind of went into that. I'm really curious what you guys think have been like one of the best sets that you have made since you've been on where you were like, we made the perfect set list. We got every character in there that we wanted. We didn't have to, you know, cut any fat. We made the legacy cards that I thought were, you know, this character had a legacy in hero clicks or I don't feel bad about missing this character. And then maybe... Uh, a little bit for extra elements, too, where you were really happy that you brought in either objects, uh, tarot cards, mystery cards, things like that, where you decide to introduce a new element to the game. Go ahead. That was a lot that I just kind of said. I fired off a lot. <laughs> um, right, so I think that my personal set that I like that we've recently put together, I know this is a little bit of a cheesy answer because you guys haven't gotten to see it yet, but Deadpool Weapon X, to me... Um, feels like it, if you're a Deadpool lover or a Wolverine lover, I don't know how you could not enjoy this set. Um, I think the more that we looked at it as we put it together and as started to, some of the sculpts start to come in and some of the gameplay design starts to come in, um, it just really, you know, pun intended, clicked in a way that was really, really fun for us. Um, you guys now know about the dice that are getting added into those. So making characters um, that have like these really unique things about them, like Gambit with the playing cards and different card suits, getting to bring that into his gameplay and also a new way for gameplay entirely in Hero Clicks with this custom die that you get to roll. Things like that, um, when they land right, they just feel really, really fun. And I think that, um, that I don't know that there's going to be a picture of a sealed release from Deadpool Weapon X. It's not going to make me laugh. You know, okay. when all the figures are on the table that's, together. That's an interesting point, too, in that I think because of the Deadpool elements of that set, there's a comedic tone to it that I think a wedge of our Heroclix fan base appreciates. And for, from listening to Dial H podcasts over time, like the silly versus serious is that spectrum of like, you know, you, you want something that uh, can be fun and lighthearted, but then you also want badass, like it is a combat tactical game. And then Wolverine on the other side of that and some of the, the uh, X-Men characters, I think have a, a, a very serious bend in our mm -hmm are uh are pretty awesome but i think it deadpool weapon x has that nice job of like it, it is very uh uh comedic but then also i think get, gets that grit that, that i think a wolverine fan's gonna want and i love that because that's the tenor of the team up right the mm -hmm. the nature of that is balancing the like absolute yeah. over the top the crazy double. guy mm -hmm. and the yeah. dead serious like battle hardened veteran type character um, and yeah, especially when you get to uh, cross those guys together or put them mm -hmm. together in any kind of way, it's it just gets really fun. And I think to, to your other point, John, like the what have we never done in a hero click set before mentality that comes into set design, like dice was something that, you know, we dug at and, and figured out a way like what is a way that we can make dice meaningful. And I think the, that was another thing, too, from working backwards on that. You know, there's the timing of the set, but then you have characters from a, a PAC standpoint that, uh, sorry, a powers and abilities card. If you're a new, <laughs> new, new uh, listener slash viewer of the podcast, you made it this far, so congrats. But the uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the there are characters where uh, regeneration matters, uh, blades, claws, fangs matters. Uh, characters where dice are intrinsic to the, the the character themselves in the game of hero clicks. So it was kind of that perfect set to, to bring dice in. And it's something I think periodically we'll, we'll test out, uh, akin to vehicles, akin to dice, akin to hero glow, yeah. uh, having things make key appearances. And I think the DNA of this being our third Deadpool release is also substantially different from the first two. So our first outing with Deadpool was, what's Deadpool? Who are all the best people to pair with him? Um, and I think the timing of that set in the market was just really great in terms of um, I, it felt like a real surge of comic fans were rallying behind Deadpool to make him as popular as he is today. And then, OK, well, that set did great. People really enjoyed it. What's the next story we can tell with Deadpool and Heroclix? And the answer, because of the way Heroclix plays, is what's the best team for Deadpool to play as a part of? And so we had Deadpool and X-Force. And so now that we've said, OK, well, what's the solo artist and, you know, what's the team? You know, this is kind of the the buddy cop set in some ways. And so getting to tell, you know, getting to angle a lot of what we're doing with Deadpool 
in a fresh way was I think what was going to keep it fresh for the fans who have been here the whole time. Yeah. And that's a big part of it too, is, um, you know, what theme or what team do we want to put in the set? Is there a, a type of gameplay that we find is either novel or is really fun or that we want to focus on for this set? And then making sure people don't only get to enjoy that gameplay at chase or super rare rarities, you know, that you'll still get to enjoy um, with unique character dice and opening dice and boosters when they're not always paired with um, something that's like the super high rarity, just to give more people a chance to enjoy those mechanics, um, to make mm -hmm. those mechanics more relevant in sealed at type formats, I, BRs and stuff like that. I think it's just making sure that it permeates every part of the set and that it ties together is also something that's, that's really important when we're putting these sets together. Perfect. Calder had asked about a favorite uh, set theme or overarching set. I'd be curious to hear yours, Jimmy. So I, I was I was trying to think about this while we were waxing poetic uh -oh. on that pool. You got to pick really one of your babies. Predict. You've been here much yeah, longer, I, so it's much harder. No, right? So I, I I think I think it's I think it's Black Panther for me. Um, I, and again, you know, I'm picking something out out there in the future. Uh, getting to so we we we've, 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 we've emphasized this Black <laughs> I'll Panther pick some before. Old, I'll pick some some way old stuff then when it's my turn yeah so we, we've we've emphasized black panther before uh but the, you know I, I think we got to to see what fans were excited about last time and double down on those things this time i think we we really got to expand the landscape of wakanda getting to connect it with the the deities and some like doing doing that research of what should go into the black panther set was a lot of fun and exciting and i learned a lot um it goes so far beyond what they had the chance to share with us in the MCU so far. So even as like a, a long time comic reader, you know, I'm an X-Men guy, somewhat a Fantastic Four guy, uh, Batman, th this was kind of just its own thing. And uh, yeah, there's there just a lot of fun stuff to explore. And I'm, I'm excited to share that with the fans in terms of what is what does Vibranium mean in 2024? You know, what does the heart shaped herb mean in 2024? Um, who are some legacy folks we can we can tap into? Pull them back, John. No. John <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. The, the big hook just comes and gets me. Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking oh, on uh, Wakanda and Black Panther set, we saw the iconics, uh, the preview, the sculpt of the oh, Wakandan really cool. Hulkbuster. Yeah. How much different is it to design an iconic set? Ooh. Oh, <laughs> we are very excited for this. Yeah, the yeah. Hulkbuster. How much, how much different is it to des design a iconic set list? Because it's obviously a lot smaller, a lot more uh, condensed, but it's also harder because you can't fit some of the things that maybe should fit in there. I think, I think it just keeps you focused. I mean, I'm I'm saying this as someone who's like doing more of the product side than the game design side, but you know, you're you're shining the white hot spotlight onto basically one thing. I think too, like the that mentality of what have we not done before is, is true for both. So like for mm -hmm. for Colossal Kong, that was like the uh, flocking was on my whiteboard of like exciting stuff to do, and then it was like okay, let's let's figure out how to make a fuzzy ape, and then you know uh, approach it from that standpoint. And then I think you know the the payoff there too of like what are those expectations from a consumer, like in terms of terrain, in terms of uh, what the dial does and the power does, you know, all get factored into. But I think like the, the primary difference for me thinking about the, uh, a booster set versus the Iconics is I think the, the booster set, you're not going to display packaging. Uh, you know, the, the idea is open it up and like you want to play with it and collect it and build uh, your, your different forces out of it. I think on the Iconics front, we think about it both as a collectible that has a display purpose to it, and then also something that people are going to want to crack open and play and, and build with. So it, it, it's two different audiences where I think the booster audience is predominantly a, a, a player or, or somebody that wants to, to get th th their hands on, on building the product, and Iconics is both a player and a collector. Yeah, uh, what I will say about choosing iconics or choosing who goes into them that's so difficult is i'm sure um you know every fan has an iconics that they want to see if not a list of iconics that they want to see and we're no different 
I bet every person on this call on the Heroclix team has a list of 10 Iconics that we're not going to get a chance to make that we wanted to make like this year. Um, you know, it's it's so exciting once you Th- this start. This is how I find out, John. <laughs> This is how I found out you no. tell me. No. <laughs> you, uh, you know, you start to look at something and you go, wow, this is so cool. Now, you know, we only make however many. There just can't be a temple every month, right? It wouldn't be sustainable for us. It wouldn't be sustainable for the fan. So when something you can't just, see for the gameplay that way either. Right. It doesn't give it enough time to to breathe. Right. Um, for people to experience what that day one meta looks like, what the counter to that looks like, what the evolution of that looks like. So for us, I think. Um, the, the real challenging thing is, okay, it's called Iconics, right? What are these iconic moments? And just like Deadpool Up and X, or just like really comics in general, is making sure we find that balance of, okay, some funny things that are iconic, like Wolverine, uh, first, or sorry, not first appearance, the um, Captive Hearts Wolverine. And then also just, you know, to say the same thing I was talking about, uh, first appearance Wolverine is an iconic comic moment, like Death of Superman, an iconic comic moment. You can't argue this is one of the most iconic stories that people think of when they think of Superman. So are we going to wait for when the next Superman themed tentpole is to get to tell that story in Heroclix? It's much more exciting to get to bring that to you in like a specialty format um into like a small like we can put a lot of attention to detail into bringing that story through the cards the packaging just a lot of extra time that we can spend on a smaller amount of figures and it really helps make those feel special i think if we did that same thing for every temple or we released that many items they wouldn't feel as like special and it wouldn't be as exciting for us to plan the ones we're going to make in the future it would be ex- as exciting for the fan to uh decide which ones they're going to get out of you know just the, the pile of iconics i think we'd be remiss to not talk about our last announced iconics too with uh dungeons and dragons iconics which yeah. uh, yes now, of course. Now, now iconics gives us an interesting mode too to see uh what if we took the the heaviest hitter from a universe and brought it out to a fan whether it's a beholder uh, displacer beast, owl bears, and get a, a sense of the appetite from the fan, the retailer, the community for it. So I, I think from our standpoint, the iconic moment, whether it's funny, serious, evocative, has a nostalgia pull, all of that is great for us. It's you know, that blend of collector and player. But I think for D&D Iconics for us, too, the thought was, oh, we've wanted to do it for a while, and the, the stars aligned and in, in the right way for us to to try it now but i think in a world without iconics how to approach that you know starting with a full booster set i think feels daunting from a player base to go from zero to booster set um i think now seeing a reaction from the fan base and hearing what they want and what kinds of products they want for it you know i think there's a lot of opportunity not only with dungeons and dragons but with a number of different properties where i think we can try it as an iconics see what people like and then it'll give us enough time to to either uh pull back or uh put our foot on the gas pedal yeah and i think with the size of iconics it just makes it really easy for us to take a big chance on something and see how fans Mm -hmm. and players react to it like kong right um we're gonna put flocking on this guy like does that make sense to be one figure in a big booster set it doesn't really feel like it gets the attention um and then we can't make it like as big and crazy as we kind of want it to be so that felt like a perfect home for something like uh kong or like trying out uh going deep on mystery again with sherlock holmes Mm -hmm. it gives us like these really little themes that we can do in a big way that don't have to be tied to something like a booster set Well, guys, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today. Thanks. You guys provided some really cool insight that I think everybody is really going to enjoy here. Uh, just overall about sets, your thoughts, opinions, the process behind them, and even Iconics and, of course, hopefully more D&D stuff down the pipeline. <laughs> so I really like the idea of we'll the do more D&D stuff. with Iconics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I was going to say, I'm we pretty finished. sure Jake we is finished. ready to commit to that. Something <laughs> is. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. all right, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so today. much. We're going to be doing more of these episodes for you, the viewer, to see here in the future. So make sure you type in the comment section below what you thought of the episode today, as well as what you want to see in the future. Like always, happy trails. <laughs>